Um, good morning. Please can I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Cabinet Committee Housing on Thursday, the 2nd of February from the Walton Suite, Winchester Guildhall. The time is now 10 a.m. My name is Councillor Paula Ferguson, Chairperson of the Cabinet, sorry, Chairperson of the Cabinet Committee for um, Community and Housing and also the Cabinet Member for Community and Housing. This meeting is being live streamed from the Council's YouTube channel and the recording will also be made available after the meeting. Subtitles can be switched on and advice on how to turn those on is set out on our website. If you are joining us online, please turn your camera and microphone off. Can everybody in the room also please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent? In the unlikely, of, unlikely event that it's necessary to evacuate the building, the fire alarm will sound. Please follow all the instructions given to you by the team. I'd like to welcome members of the public who are here today. Um, I don't believe we have any public questions, but you are very welcome and we're glad that you're with us and also to any members of the public who are joining online. Um, just before I turn to the agenda, I would like to um, announce that there is a change to the agenda today. We won't be taking the Disability Facilities Grant policy today. That will now come to Cabinet Housing in March. There are a number of issues that need to be resolved in that paper um, that have only just come to light and those will be considered. And as I said, that paper will now come back to us at our next March Cabinet Housing Committee. Thank you. And if I can now turn to the agenda, uh, do we have any apologies today? Thank you. Apologies received from Councillor Baffo. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, do we have any disclosures, disclosures of interest? No, thank you. Um, I don't believe we have any requests from councillors to speak. I can't see any councillors in the room. There's, there's an armchair person, thank you. And as I said, we I do also know that we don't have any um, public participation today. Can I ask members of the committee, please, to. Um, oh, I just one more thing. I wanted to um, please to say that we have both Mr Light and Mr Chafe with us on our committee, as usual, as standing members. I also wanted people to know that we also have Councillor Clear, Councillor Scott, Councillor Horrell, myself, Councillor Gordon-Smith and Councillor Power, um, who Councillor Power and Councillor Gordon-Smith and I are the um, voting members of the committee, but everybody else is welcome today as well. Thank you. Um, so we're turning to the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any issues that people want to raise or are we happy to approve? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much indeed. Um, I have we're now going to go on to Chair's announcements. I have two announcements, they're both short. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome Simon Hendy to the Cabinet Housing Committee. Simon joined um, Winchester City Council on Monday this week and is our new strategic director with responsibility for housing. And I'm sure like me, you are looking forward to working with him. Thank you. My second announcement is I'm also pleased to announce that the Retrofit Ready programme for council tenants is moving ahead well and letters have already gone out to all 806 tenants who indicated they would like to be part of that programme, detailing the next steps, the first of which will be the energy assessment. If we move on to item seven on the um, agenda, we have an update from Andrew Palmer on the new homes programme. So Andrew, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the um, this is a, uh, an update on the new homes programme. 
Um, I'll, what I'll do is cover the current schemes that we've got on site. So uh, moving on through the slides. So as you'll see, um, starting on the top left, Southbrook Cottages um, should have started last week, um, but we'll start on Monday with the cordoning off of the garage area and the demolition of the existing garages. Um, that's a CGI of what the scheme will ultimately look like, which is six uh, homes in total, two flats, two two bedroom flats and four one bedroom flats, all built to passive house standards. So I think as I've discussed at previous meetings, this is our pilot passive house project that we're very keen to get underway. Um, the contractor is also very keen to get underway um, because I think we all recognise um, nationally, it's one way of meeting the um, you know, energy redu reduction agenda. So we're very excited to start this scheme. Um, and in the next few weeks, we will start to see progress on site. Uh, the top right is Whiteley. Now we've taken a uh, handover of 12 new homes on that site just before Christmas nine of which rented properties which are all let and three shared ownership. One of the shared ownership properties has been reserved and we're looking to exchange. Um, contracts very shortly on that, so that's going well. The remaining remaining 42 homes will be handed over between March and August uh, this year, so that will be um, a very exciting to see that scheme finished. Um, and it is a whole phase of the development, so the contractors will then move off site, so people will be living uninterrupted by any construction works after August. And finally, um, we have the scheme at Winnell, which is on track for the three houses to be handed over early in August. So the three houses will be handed over in August. The remainder of the flats uh, in two blocks are scheduled to be handed over in November, 8 October, early November. They've had a few weather delays over the last month, as you can imagine, with very wet weather and very cold temperatures, which has prevented them uh, laying a lot of the brickwork on the site. Um, and we expect that to, to result in a slight extension to the programme. But overall, we're pleased with the, the the progress on site. They've done their initial air testing works as well, which have um, have already shown how um, airtight they are, even without the um, external cladding being added to the building. So um, these houses will be built to, uh, to a ACB standard, low energy standard. Um, so we're very keen to see those um, uh, finished as well. So moving on, um, these are the schemes that have, sub, have been submitted for planning at the moment, um, and you'll probably be all familiar with the names of those. Um, three of the schemes are held up as we try to address nutrient neutrality issues, and I'll come on to explain a little bit more about that later. And the last scheme is affected by uh, biodiversity net gain issues. So that's something we're going to have to uh, look at as well very closely. The good news is about Woodman Close is we now found out after doing the geohydrology survey that the her water table um, flows into the river test catchment, which means we don't have to mitigate for phosphates. So initially we thought we'd have to mitigate for phosphates. Um, we had a survey back last week that showed actually the water flowed in the other direction towards the river test. So we have to mitigate for nitrates, but not phosphates, which means that we can ask planning to determine the application because we do have a nitrate solution. Some good news there for that. Close. Moving on. Uh, so. There's a list of um, some of the schemes under consideration at the moment. They're a mixture of um, schemes on our land, but also of schemes where we're talking to developers. Um, some of the schemes were not in control of the timetable, which is, causes us some frustration. And in particular, I, I, on that list, the last two schemes, the extra care scheme at Kings Barton, and the extra ski care scheme at Whiteley. The developer is obliged to give us the land for both of those schemes. However, we 
we are in constant contact with them saying, well, when are you going to get to this phase of the development? And that's that's what's holding us up, taking those forward at the moment, just understanding their own phasing on the overall development. So in total, there's 60 homes at Kings Barton and 60 homes at Whiteley, uh, which we know will come forward, um, but we're being frustrated by the timetable. But I believe there was a Kings Barton forum yesterday, uh, which uh, my development manager went to, I think, uh, um, and I yet to have an update, but I'm sure perhaps members that attended that um, perhaps know more now about the timetable for that phase of the development. So we have appointed um, an architect to just make sure that the site that they are offering us actually accommodates 60 homes. So we're doing the, the background checking at the moment, but we need to know more details about when that phase is likely to be developed. Moving on. Um, just a very brief summary of where we are on the programme, and that's the programme to deliver a thousand homes over the 10 year period. So we've now completed 133, 124 on site, 23 in planning. Um, schemes under consideration amount to about 300 homes. So in total, there's about 580 there uh, in the programme all being actively negotiated at the moment. So we're on, you know, broadly on track to deliver that thousand home target by 2030. So moving on to the, what, what's one of the principal issues that we are facing at the moment in, and why some of our schemes are held up in planning at the moment, is around nutrient mitigation. This is quite a complex um, subject area. So I've tried to explain, first of all, um, <clears throat> It did start in 2019 with the view about, and it was particularly about nit nitrate mitigation at that stage, and it affected the whole of the Solent region, and I'll, I'll have to show you a map in a minute. And it was to address the issue of excess nitrates entering the Solent and um, up, upsetting, shall I say, the natural balance. So you have massive algae blooms in the summer, which would remove oxygen from the water, which prevented other plant life growing. So there was there was a huge issue um, with the Solent turning green at times with excess algae. So this was addressed through various planning statements. Um, and the, the industry worked hard to find a solution to nitrates. And um, there's a number of potential solutions which I'll come on to explain at the moment. So nitrates were under control. We knew that there was a solution to that. March 22, the advice was updated to include phosphate neutrality. And the particular issue here was the river Itchin and the river Itchin catchment area, <coughs> which obviously affects a lot of our development in Winchester and especially Winchester town. So, and what, what there isn't, or what there wasn't at the time, is any understanding of how we could mitigate for phosphates. And that's something that we've been working on internally to help progress our own new homes program and what i hope is by march time be able to come to members with a particular with, with a solution about how we can address uh, phosphate mitigation so i'll come to that in a minute but just moving on um just show you a quick slide of it doesn't come out very well but the affected areas are different and it's worth pointing out that nitrates cover a much broader area, as you can see, it covers most of Hampshire, New Forest and moving uh, east into Chichester. And as I say, it was to do with what's happening in the Solent. The phosphate issue is tackling issues specifically in the River Itchin. So it's two slightly different things there. So what are the potential solutions to this? Um, for nitrates, um, we can buy land and remove it from previous use. We can develop wetlands and that we've got one scheme underway at the moment where we're just working through the calculations with Natural England and the Environment Agency um, to see, we know roughly what the cost is to the HRA to improve this piece of land and make it a wetland. We just want to make sure that we've got enough credits, generating enough credits to pay for it at the end. So we're just waiting for that confirmation. Um, 
we can improve our existing sewage treatment works um, or we could buy credits from landowners with their own mitigation projects and there's several in the district and actually we're going to have to do that for Winnell so the Winnell flat scheme we're going to have to buy some credits because our own credits won't be generated in time we don't think um, for occupation in well, the first phase in October and the second phase in, in November so um, there are um, landowners with with credit schemes that we will we can we can go to and actually buy those buy those credits but they must be bought before the first occupation of those properties as I say phosphates is slightly different but again we can improve our existing sewage treatment works um, which offer a good potential to to mitigate phosphates and we could buy land and set it aside although that is um, while some local authorities have done that in other parts of the country, the opportunities are, I think are limited and the costs very high in this, uh, this in this particular area. So let's look at um, quickly what we're doing. Potentially um, what we've been investigating since, since September is where we have sewage treatment works which are in the itching catchment area. And I say sewage treatment works, they could be as crude as soakways or septic tanks um, serving very small numbers of properties, but actually generate quite high levels of phosphate. Um, if we improve what we're testing out with the Environment Agency and Natural England is, if we replace these, these existing works, which are often 60, 70 years, years old and were built when the council houses were first built in the 50s, um, how much of a credit will it generate to us? So we chose three pilot sewage treatment works, which we thought would offer us the greatest opportunities uh, for generating um, uh, credits. And what it demonstrated was potentially we could mitigate the whole of our new homes program um, and have credits left if we wanted to sell them to other developers so that they too could progress their housing schemes as well. The work is, is very complex and involves, as I said, geohydrologists working out how quickly water enters the water table, how far it then takes to reach the local water course, which then feeds into the river Itchin. So there's a lot of work and that work has to be signed off, if you like, by the environment agents. But what we hope is to be able to demonstrate to both of those bodies, if we have this credible plan to improve our sewage treatment works, they will allow us to use those credits in advance of that sewage treatment work being repaired, because we should be regarded as a trusted public body who will honour our commitment to um, investment into into improving sewage treatment works. So we have set aside some money in the HRA budget for this year um, uh, to to fund this this work, um, which will allow our new homes program and those schemes that I previously mentioned that are locked up in planning at the moment to, to progress. And then the council has an option of what it does with the remaining credits, whether it banks them for the rest of its program or whether it offers them to to uh, private developers. So the results of this pilot investigation should be expected in March 2023. We should know that we're asking now for the costs involved in replacing these uh, sewage treatment works and then working with the Partnership for Urban South Hampshire to convince Natural England and the Environment Agency that our plans are sound and that we will uh, implement them. Thank you. Um, I see. Any questions? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Palmer, for such a, a good update and presentation. <clears throat> and also for bringing the um, issue of the nitrate, the nutrient mitigation to us today. If I may, I have one question first. Um, we do have our target of a thousand new homes. The figures you put up. Um, of what we're currently looking at and what we sort of have on our in our sites were 580. How do we go about meeting 
the shortfall. Okay. Obviously, what what what's there is a is a list of schemes that are under active negotiation. There is another list of schemes which are very much um, still being discussed that we're not in a position to reveal at the moment. There's also the council's own large corporate projects, Central Winchester Regeneration, Cattle Market, and um, other schemes that are likely to come through the local plan. That I've not included at the list at the moment um, because they're probably going to be delivered at the um, or come to the fore in the back end of our program. So what you had there is a list that will probably reflect the first five years of our program. The second five years from 2026 to 2030, um, we have started initial work on that as well. So I'm still very confident that we will meet a thousand home target by 2030. Mm, um, thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions on the presentation? Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Andrew, for um, a, a very good presentation. Um, and I have two questions, Chair, but if I if I may, I'll ask the first one and perhaps come back to the others um, uh, this time. Um, extra care, we learnt a lot from um, Chesil and the new way of delivering accommodation for our ageing population, which we know from the 21 census is something we have to be prepared for. Um, and the opportunity to have extra care at Kings Barton and indeed in Whiteley is a really positive uh, step forward from us. Um, how are we working to ensure that we learn from Chesil and all that we did there and the good uh, that we should repeat and maybe the opportunities to change and how are we managing then that negotiation with the developer and indeed the county who are a partner with that provision uh, to ensure that we have the best facility possible. Thank you. Um, Mr Palmer. Thank you. Yes, I mean, when we finished uh, Chesil, we um, after 12 months, we went back and did a review with the, with the, the uh, tenants there as well to find out what worked and what didn't work. So we've got the occupants um, suggested ways of doing things differently and what, what works. We've also got our own experience in terms of managing that building now and what space we do need, what facilities we do need and perhaps facilities we put in that we didn't need. So we've got our own experience. The county have also worked in update, updating guidance as well on extra care and again specifically looking at client groups within that and what their needs may be and how they have changed in the future. So we'll work very closely with the county council in terms of the design to make sure it, re, it meets the aspirations of elderly people. So um, we have already started those discussions with them. We've appointed initially the, the same architect that dealt that built um, Chesil for us as well. So they have a list of things from they know now what works and what doesn't work. So we're using their experience. And we're negotiating with Carla's lead architect to make sure that the site that we get there, most importantly, is well integrated within that centre and is not surrounded, shall I say, by antisocial uses, for example. So it's a, a bit of a three way process at the moment, using our experience, our architect's experience and making sure that Carla give us the right size site as well. So we have a sort of small design team working on that at the moment. Um, thank you, Mr Palmer, and certainly from the, the consultation that was held yesterday, um, up at Kings Barton, um, it would seem that the extra care scheme is in the next phase of development and they have indeed moved the site. So I'm glad to know that we are we're looking at that very, very carefully to make sure it meets our needs and specifically the needs of those new residents when they should go in. Um, obviously, we'll be building to the highest um, environmental standards and ensuring that heating systems that we've learned some of those lessons as well from Chesil's Lodge, I'm sure. Um, do any other members have another question? Councillor Horrell, are you happy for Councillor Scott? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr Palmer, for your presentation. Um, 
the current sort of target for 580 homes, dominantly, I would think, are probably on mainly city council land. Moving forward to go and achieve the thousand target, what you've mentioned, are we looking at land availability around the Winchester district, which is not our land, that we could maybe purchase and actually probably discover, we'll probably build a much more better is you know, 200, 300 at one time rather than sort of little piecemeal garage sites, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, we have, we try to have a program each year which has a, a sites, certainly one large site and a series of smaller sites and we try to keep a balance to that program. Um, so a lot of the smaller sites will be in our ownership, but we are developing them to not only produce housing, but to tackle other problems. So as you are aware, in terms of the Indom Way of Box Lane garages, um, anti-social behaviour in those garage areas, an ideal opportunity to put more family homes in. So those schemes are important to do, not just for the numbers, but for actually improving neighbourhoods. Um, we we have reached out to a number of developers for any larger sites that they may have. I think what's probably happening at the moment is a lot of sites are, are have been put forward in for the local plan for consideration, and for a developer, his main profit is if he can de deliver market housing. But not all of those sites will be accepted, and I think then there's an opportunity for us to have a conversation with landowners to talk about a community led development or an exception scheme which you know serves the 100% affordable housing with a, maybe a small element of shared ownership and sub market but actually um, won't generate the significant levels of profit but actually are more acceptable to the community so i think the local plan process is the key for those particular sites to to to, to, to come our way, but we've reached out to a number of landowners and a number of agents and, and building companies and saying any opportunities that you've got, any difficult sites you've got, come and talk to us and we'll, you know, we can sense check them with local members and get a community feel of whether there's a, an affordable housing scheme there. Um, that's the power, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Palmer, thank you. Lovely presentation, lovely time. Um, a few questions on the housing programme, and then I'm afraid several more on nutrient, nutrient neutrality. The um, 42 that are coming up whitely, are they all affordable? Um, secondly, I'd love to know where Dean Lane is in Allsford. Well, you can light my darkness on that. And thirdly, we have a number of um, not large sites, but significant numbers of housing that, that have planning permission. And the original plan was that the affordable element would be with RHPs. Are those sites on your long shopping list as potentially being built by Winchester City Council? I'll come back to the neutrality, Chairman. Um, and and Councillor Power, I will actually allow Councillor Horrell to have her second question before you have your, your second bite. But if you could answer those, please, Mr Palmer, first. Thank you. Uh, Whiteley. Um, yes, they're all affordable. Uh, not all affordable rent. Some there's shared ownership on there as well. So there's a mixture of rents that will be charged at 70 percent. So not the 80 percent affordable, but the policy 70 percent. Um, and there will be shared ownership. So the split that was originally agreed of the 54 homes was 27 shared ownership and 27 rented. And that's what we'll do. And that's that's what's what's uh, planned. As I say, there's only six flats on that scheme. Uh, all the rest are houses. So there'll be um, a good mix there. And and the shared ownership and rented are pepper potted so that there is they're not exclusively shared ownership in one area and exclusively rent in another. So we've tried to develop a mixed community there. Uh, Dean Lane, we've been offered a site in Dean Lane by a private developer uh, at the Dean, should I say? Sorry, yeah, the Dean. And so we've been offered a site there and a developers offered us a, uh, a 
scheme for seven one bedroom flats and one two bedroom flat uh, with which we will purchase off the shelf um, but it's in planning and submitted for planning consideration i was particularly interested to see how they've offered mitigation for phosphates and nitrates within that application but um we will we will see um so that's been offered to us to purchase um so we're just running through the viability at the moment and the final the final uh question was about future large sites um and i think we've certainly made our intentions known where the council owns land and has influence over um large amounts of new housing that uh you know we would be interested to deliver the affordable housing and not have it delivered through registered provider um if it's a scheme where we don't have any influence that's more difficult to do because they are free to choose who develops the affordable housing obviously we ensure it's affordable but we have limited say in terms of the standards that those houses are delivered at and i think you know our own aspirations are to have um to meet as close to you know a passive house standard as possible developers don't build to that standard at the moment unfortunately um, thank you mr palmer and just for clarity the if for the scheme of the team if that was going to be brought forward um a paper on the viability of that scheme of course would come to this cabinet housing committee yes we'd obviously do a full business case to be approved by cabinet housing um, thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Councillor Horrell, but I'm just going to check that um, Mr. Light or Mr. Ta Mr. Chafee didn't want to ask any specific questions. We'll just get you a fresh one. One second. Uh, yes, we're very pleased at the list and uh, encouraging that we have been able to uh, look forward enough to deal with things and uh, it answers a lot of uh, queries we've had in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr Chafe. Um, Councillor Horrell, would you like to ask your second question? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. And it moves to the area that Councillor Power, I think, was going to raise, which is uh, nitrate and phosphate uh, mitigation, because clearly uh, we've had many schemes on hold for some considerable time um, and our need for homes does not diminish. So uh, we're ready to go. Communities want them. Um, and so uh, but we are I'm very cognizant, particularly on the wetlands project where we're being held up still uh, by the authorities. Data has been provided and I'm sort of closely involved in the wetlands project and it's a great idea but we are in the the, the sort of time scale of other authorities um, and likewise I think Mr Palmer said that obviously we've got to refer to EA and Natural England on our suggestions which are fantastic what a great opportunity to use what we thought was a hindrance as a as an asset in our sewage works is there anything further we can do as an authority to try and move these projects ahead more quickly because they are the you know the the key to unlocking Being to find a solution um, but if you could also um, address how we're getting on with wetlands and if there is any more exertion we can put. And, and just to say on, on the issue of the phosphates, I think as Mr Palmer said in his presentation, this is something we started looking to at in September because we knew we needed to try and drive forward a solution for where perhaps others were dragging their feet. And again, the work we've done to enable us to get to this point is very worthwhile. And if we can get an approved scheme by March, that would be extremely beneficial to our new homes program. But if you could just clarify, thank you, Mr. Palmer. Yes, it's been very helpful being having this this uh, phosphate project because it's probably the only one in Hampshire at the moment, um, according to the um, planning director who, who's dealing with this at PUSH. So we're using push to their influence at a strategic level. So they are the ones 
tackling Natural England and the Environment Agency on our behalf. So we're finding it very difficult to get traction with them and they're very slow in their response. PUSH have a more strategic role, more Hampshire wide, and they've been um, really upping their game in terms of negotiations with Natural England and the Environment Agency. And they're the ones that we're looking to, to get this uh, almost sign off, almost blanket sign off, uh, you know, to our plans at the end of the day. And I believe the leader is involved with discussions with um, the PUSH as well and other Hampshire authorities. So um, PUSH are very keen to use our ideas that we're generating here for phosphate mitigation as a demonst to demonstrate that there are solutions out there. And this is this is one way in which which you know building can be unlocked. So our involvement with PUSH, we're using their influence at a, at a much more sub-regional level. And um, just for the benefit of anyone listening online, PUSH stands for the Partnership for South Hampshire. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take um, one or two more questions before we move on with the agenda item. I will give Councillor Clear the opportunity, Councillor Power, first. Thank you, Councillor Clear. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Palmer, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Would it be possible um, some of the sites under consideration, Wine Cross Cottages at North Boar Hunt, can you elaborate a little bit on that at the present time? Thank you. Yes, so as you're probably aware, we've got a pair of properties there, non-traditional construction, very difficult to bring up to acceptable energy performance standards. So um, part of our internal asset management group that we have in housing, we looked at what other potential solutions were there were for this site. Um, and we've got to a position where we've got um, a potential four home scheme there, uh, four or five homes of a combination of a two and one bedroom flats. It's significantly constrained in planning terms because of its it's in the countryside um, and there's long views into the site from public footpaths. So the, from a planning perspective, it's very sensitive. Um, so even though the houses have big front gardens and back gardens, that it's not all developable space. So we've been in negotiation with planning our planning colleagues to see what would be acceptable. So we think we can get a, a four to five home replacement scheme on that site. Um, subject to any further negotiations uh, around trees and, and various other ecology issues, um, I would expect that a planning application could be could be submitted during the summer period. But we would, of course, what we'd bring back to members of Cabinet Housing is an outline business case first to say this is what's proposed. And even before the outline business case, we'd be talking to local members and neighbours to sense checks those plans to make sure that they're they're OK. Um, thank you very much, Mr Palmer. Councillor Power, I know you had several questions. Can you ask your best question, please? Thank you. Uh, they are brief. They are brief. I'm very excited about being able to bank uh, new nation credits. How we hold those on the balance sheet is a challenge for another day. Um, the nitrate credits, are they in the Winchester district? Main question. And the number of sewage treatment plants we hold, I've seen two numbers. One is 23, one is 50. I'd like to know the number in the HRA at least. Thank you. Uh, just going to that last question. I think uh, referring back to our maps, any phosphate mitigation has to be upstream of where you intend to do the development. So we looked at all the sewage treatment works that were upstream of Winchester, which is where principally our development's going to be. So I think the 23 refers to the number of sewage treatment plants, and I say that because some are literally septic tanks, uh, that are upstream of, of, of Winchester. So I think the larger figure is probably more to do with how many in total we own. I'm, I'm I'm not 100% confident, but that's my interpretation of there or thereabouts where we are at those sewage treatment works. So we've identified 23 which can contribute phosphate mitigation, I think is a, 
simpler way of putting it. Um, so that all the phosphate mitigation, in effect, will be in the Winchester district um, because it literally has to be draining into the River Itchen. Um, there's a small part to the north, I think, in Basingstoke, which is drains in, um, but that would have to refer back to those maps that I, I, I showed earlier. Um, and obviously some villages like Sparshaw are right between the two. So the sewage treatment works in Sparshaw does drain into the Itchin, but the groundwater drains into the test catchment. I said it was complicated um, and it does cause us to think carefully what we do and where we do it. Um, nitrate credits, on the other hand, can be bought um, from a trading platform and those mitigation projects can be anywhere within the Solent catchment district. So, for instance, we've had when we're looking at buying nitrate credits for Winnell scheme, we there is a scheme that's removed over in Tess Valley, which has removed a pig farm from its, its use. They've generated so many credits and they're selling them to anybody who wants a nitrate credit. So we can buy nitrate credits from Tess Valley, from the Tess Valley area to mitigate our schemes and vice versa. Um, thank you very much, Mr Palmer, and thank you, members, for your questions. Um, I think it's been a really good presentation today, a very good discussion and informative for everyone on the committee and everyone listening. Uh, Mr Palmer, you have a standing item on our committee, so we will look forward to seeing you again in March. Thank you. Um, I would therefore like to move to item nine on our agenda today, the Housing Services Compensation and Reimbursements Policy. And I'm pleased to invite Mr Kingston to the table. Um, also, for people listening online, um, at the beginning, I should have also said we also have um, officers Julie Knight, Gillian Knight and Sharon Evans in the room with us as well today. Um, I'm actually really pleased to see this housing compensation paper come forward to us today for consideration. Um, I know that the council prides itself on the level of service it provides to tenants in relation to property services, and it always strives to get things right first time. However, we do have over 5,000 properties, and there are occasions when things go wrong. Therefore, what this housing services compensation and reimbursement policy does is it gives that clarity to tenants to understand what they're entitled to in term, if things were to go wrong and how we want to work with them to make sure they're not out of pocket and that there is some um, recompense for um, if there are if things happen to their homes. Um, it also gives officers that clarity that they need to make sure that the policy is followed fairly and that no tenants are disadvantaged. Um, Mr Kingston, I'm sure you may want to add something to that. Um, is there anything you'd like to say in addition? Is no. Um, I was just going to touch on a couple of the paragraphs in the report, um, specific paragraphs, not go for everyone, obviously. Um, under 3.6, where we've got workforce implications, we, we've made it clear there that at the moment we don't know how involved this policy is going to be in terms of administration. So um, we will need to review it. Um, at the moment, we do do compensation and reimbursement payments on a very much ad hoc basis. But as it says elsewhere in the report, we don't know how much additional attention this, this policy might attract once it's in. So that will need to be reviewed over time. Um, and obviously the policy as it stands doesn't cover every eventuality. Um, things will you know, continue to arrive, which we haven't covered for. Um, so we will need, need to review the policy on a, a periodic basis. Um, under four there, it makes it clear that the policy is, is applicable to tenants and leaseholders. Probably I just need to clarify because uh, a, a point funny enough came up the other day in terms of a leaseholder issue where a leaseholder stays in as an example to let an officer in to look at the windows. Um, and as a council is responsible for the windows, then if that appointment wasn't met, then we would expect compensation to be paid. So it isn't just about communal facilities for leaseholders, it's any element that the authority is responsible for. 
So it could be their windows, and if we need to get in, uh, it would obviously apply to missed appointments as an example in that case. The in terms of consultation and communication, obviously went through the TACT um, support group, which I believe you know were in general favour and supported it, which is good. Um, and it also went through business housing policy committee last June as well. So it's done the rounds a bit in terms of people looking at what we're suggesting. Um, under six, I just wanted to clarify what I was trying to get to in number six, um, because although this is about compensation reimbursement for missed appointments and those sort of things, a lot of the issues surrounding missed appointments are to do with heating systems. So we have 5,000 heating systems, 4,500 of those will be gas or they could be biomass or, or whatever we've got, over 250 square miles. So I think this is a useful or will be a useful um, avenue to pursue in terms of we're about to look at the heating strategy with a large number of tenants. So I think when we're looking at heating strategies, we have to ask ourselves, well, if we've got a lot of if we've got missed appointments, why have we got missed appointments? Why have we even got appointments in the first place? And it's because the systems aren't reliable enough. So in moving to a new heating strategy, we need to seriously consider systems that don't need maintenance. Now, I wish they were out there, but and, and they might be out there. But so, you know, our systems are highly, um, uh, inherently high maintenance. You know, we spend a lot of money uh, maintaining our gas systems. Um, so we need to move to ideally systems that don't need maintenance, don't need appointments, you don't get missed appointments. And, and a large proportion of the traffic through the housing hub will be to do with heating systems solely. Um, so I just thought, I'd, you know, that's what I was trying to make the point there. Um, in terms of 15.5, I think it came up at the Business and Planning Committee last year. People wanted to see any payments agreed quickly and dealt with quickly. I fully agree with that. You know, if if we agree, we hold up our hands and we've got something wrong, well, the payment needs to be made quickly. So it's about quick resolution, move on. Um, so that's important as well. Um, I think that's about it uh, for, from me. Thank you. Um, thank you um, very much, Mr Kingston. And again, I just for the committee's um, benefit today, we will actually be moving to additional recommendations on this paper. At the moment, we have a single recommendation that the Cabinet Committee Housing approve the Housing Services Compensation Reimbursement Policy set out in Appendix 1. Obviously, we're still going to discuss the paper, but to let you know at the outset, we will be adding two more recommendations. The first that we have the delegated authority the corporate head of housing in consultation with the cabinet member for minor changes as required because again this is a new policy um, and secondly that the policy will be reviewed fully on a biannual basis so those two recommendations when we come to them i'll go back through those but just for the committee to bear those in mind in light of um, mr kingston's comments um, we'll start with questions um, does anybody want to open? Councillor Scott. Um, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kingston, for your uh, paper here. Um, I concur with the comments from the Chair. The services for best, best results of our tenants is, is high. In, in my estimation, you do a brilliant service. So, first of all, I want to thank you, for, uh, especially your staff. They do, uh, and I can say that from a tenant point of view, that you provide an absolute fantastic service to us tenants. Um, to make this thing work, Mr. Kingston, how is the current engagement with contractors? Because quite often when we get to sticky wickets with contractors, it's parts not on the van, so stuff like that, which means triggers another appointment, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes it could be the conversation for a missed appointment, but it could be the frustration that something so simple like a thumbstack not being on a van can delay uh, a job being fixed you know and stuff like that so what's the current engagement with all the contractors we have to make sure they are supplied their, their workers with vans with all the parts they need when they come out to the jobs uh as you know councillor scott this is a running a running issue in terms of um and and it's it's disappointing in terms of it isn't just with, shall we say, CCS who currently do a lot of the gas servicing, 
uh, in terms of heating systems, but we've had it with all the previous incumbents in terms of how much van stock they keep. It is a very, um, you know, some companies are more happy to take much bigger van stock than others, but, you know, I, I'm aware there are a lot of situations or some situations, shall we say, where uh, an engineer will turn up and won't have what I call the most basic something on his van. Might, now, he might have just run out on the last job, um, but if he hasn't got a radiator valve, I just think that's poor. You know, it's almost like he should have basic materials on his on his van. So to answer your question, I think if someone stays in in good faith and a man turns up and he hasn't got what he would what I would expect him to have, then I would say that's that's effectively a missed appointment. He, he's going to have to come back another time or there should be some reimbursement or compensation in effect of that because it's another visit, another inconvenience. Um, so I, I, I fully support what, what, what you're saying. I mean, you know, it, it's it is very frustrating because and the crazy thing is when you speak to the contractors management teams, it's very frustrating for them because they don't get paid for a board who calls these contractors. So, you know, the management team want the man to go there once with the correct kit, do the job, leave. Um, they don't get paid for a port of calls, so if they go about once, twice, three times, they don't get paid any more. So it's in no one's interest, particularly, you know, let alone the tenant, for not doing the job. But it can be very frustrating and disappointing when it happens, as, as you know and I know. Um, thank you, Councillor Scott, and thank you, um, Mr Kingston. I do have three other members, but I just wanted to follow up on that, if I may, Mr Kingston. In the paper, it um, refers to the fact there'd be no compensation for a lack of access to property. But we sometimes have that conflict, conflict where a tenant says, I was home, but nobody called. How are we going to resolve that in light of this compensation reimbursement paper? I, th I, think, um, I think I said at the committee last year, um, this is where the admin can be can turn into a bit of a nightmare, it, you know, he said, she said, you know, tenants will swear blind sometimes that someone's been there and the contractor will do exactly the same from his perspective. And the contractors are getting a lot sharper in terms of taking pictures now of where they can show they proved lettered the door or put the thing through the door. Um, you know, but we've had situations where they've, they've provided a, a, photo, a photograph, say, of the, the car being put in the door the tenant will swear by no one knock the door so you get into this how much what, to what level do you go to try in terms of who's telling the truth it's very difficult because a contractor virtually all the contractors osborne and ccs they've all got sat now they've all got tracking on their vans now you know they can quite easily prove the man's been there now whether or not he got out of his van or walked up the path or knocked the door um you know, and and some some you know you will always get dishonest tradesmen. They say they've been there or haven't. You know, they've been there and they haven't. Um, we had an incident last year where a tenant cap caught it on their own video cam that you know came to the door but didn't actually knock it. You know that happens, but I I would say that it's not in the contractor's management. They don't want to see that. It's just wasted time, abortive costs as far as they're concerned. Um, and will you get the old tradesman on Friday afternoon who doesn't want to do a job? I'm sure you will. Um, you know, so it is very difficult because we're covering massive areas and it's very difficult to monitor it regularly until we get the feedback from the tenant that they haven't been um, and vice versa. Um, thank you, Mr Kingston. Um, I have Councillor Gordon-Smith, then Councillor Horrell, then Councillor Clear, Councillor Power. Um, so, Councillor Gordon-Smith. Yes, I, I think like many private householders, I think we're pretty envious of the levels of maintenance and the response rates uh, in for, for the Winchester tenancies. Um, I, I was got slightly um, involved before Christmas on a problem with a house where there was a plumbing failure that caused damage. And it, it, afterwards, it became apparent that because of the cold weather and the mild period that preceded it, everybody started switching on their heating at the same time. And of course, things like condensing pipes and so on had frozen up and so on. I just wondered if there's any way around trying to even out the, these sudden peaks that might happen. I mean, I understand that they're going to be putting in more automatic uh, water pressure systems and so on. Well, that's an idea. but. 
Um, thank you, Councillor Gordon Smith. Um, this was a question that was actually raised at full council um, around the, the problem that we had when everyone turned on the heating system because we had that very cold snap. And um, I believe, um, Mrs. Knight, that we're going to put a communication program in place to try and alleviate this. Would you like to elaborate? It was a particularly unique, as you mentioned, unique problem this year because normally we brace ourselves for tenants turning on the heating in a bit earlier in the year, October, November. Um, but obviously, due to the cost of living, lots of people were really were really um, trying to prevent doing that. So we have got a we will be we will have a communications plan this year, and we will have literature that will support that to say to people how important it is to try and test your systems early so that we can fit in the repairs rather than being sort of inundated with with needs at the time. So we will be looking at a robust communication plan around that. But I think Councillor Gordon Smith, it also speaks to the point Mr. Kingston was making about when we look at heating systems going forward making sure that we have heating systems that are more reliable, but maybe aren't as susceptible to the big breakdown in the winter. Um, so I think there are two two elements coming out of this. One, communication, and two, the, um, and two also looking at the actual heating system. Um, can I please go on to Councillor Horrell? Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Mr. Kingston, um, for uh, introducing uh, the paper. Um, we mentioned last June um, about a uh, friendlier version of the policy, uh, which is still in draft in January. Um, I think if you're um, uh, uh, reading this, it is quite in, um involved shall i say and i think therefore a much more consumer friendly version so that our tenants know they can easily access this and the expectations would be helpful so my my question really is when do we hope to have that available appreciate we're still crafting the policy and you're seeking um uh, authority to make any alterations but nonetheless I think that easy read version is is crucial and also within the uh, feedback that we uh, gave last year was the issue of the 15 pounds for the compensation and a desire to have a higher level we've um, added the loss of earnings piece but again that makes another complication in terms of claims and maybe some additional administration so can I just clarify why we went for a more perhaps convoluted version of a higher amount rather than just actually going with the uh, level that was recommended at that time thank you um, thank you Councillor Horrell um, I do know that the easy read version is very much underway. I've been sent a draft of the text. What I haven't been sent is the, the glossy completed version. But um, Mrs Knight, do you want to address that question first and then we'll go on to the policy and the missed appointments? Yes, of course. As Councillor Ferguson said, we do now have it in draft form. We're waiting for to get readers panel clearance, which we're hoping to get early next week, and then we will have a nice glossy uh, version to run past yourself and, and members. And then we will do obviously a very robust circulation of that. It will be on the website. We have over uh, 400 email addresses now, so we can make sure that we email and get the, and get harder copies out to those that don't. So we will do a robust circulation of it as well. And just on that issue of the £15, whether that was adequate for a missed appointment, it was certainly something that TACT had raised. Um, and I think, Mr Kingston, you spoke earlier about how most of those missed appointments relate to the gas servicing contract. And I know we have a reciprocal agreement with them where we could counterclaim against them. But I note in the policy, we do very specifically, we have taken that on board. And in 3.01.04, which is on 79 of our report pack, um, it does go into what greater reimbursement would be given if people have actually missed work. But I wonder if you can clarify why we stuck with the 15 and added this um, clause, which I think is comprehensive and reflective of, of possible loss of earnings. Um, when it could be more difficult to administer. But if you could just clarify the thinking, thank you. Yes, I think um, 
I know there was a suggestion that maybe it should be raised to £25. Pounds. Um, I, I would just um, say a word of caution, really. We need to be clear about. We don't want to be seen to be using this as a penalty against the contractor because you get into legal complications when things are regarded as a penalty. Um, we thought the fifteen pound was probably the fifteen pounds was probably still correct in terms of a measure of missing the appointment, um, and then to have, I think Steve added the loss of earnings things as a separate thing. It was almost where I think the discussions from memory when it started, it was more about well, if someone stayed in and missed you know, loss of earnings and things like that, is it, it was getting quite well. What are we trying to do here? It's almost recognizing we missed the appointment. We don't want to get into varying degrees of compensation for people on different salaries because it gets really messy. Um, so it's trying to find a, a compromise where it would still be easy to apply because if it's not easy to apply, it will, it will turn into a bit of a mess if we're not careful. So it's trying to find something that's a, a happy medium. Um, so yeah, I mean, so we, we thought sticking with the 15 was correct. Um. Thank you, Mr. Kingston. And I, I think that does speak to the fact that we are adding, we are going to be adding those extra recommendations today so that we can look at this policy as we go. If there are minor changes that need to be made and equally we will do that full review because it is a new policy and we will be seeing how it works for tenants and also for the for the council. Um, Mr. Light or Mr. Chafe, I, I believe that um, Ms. Mellish, Mrs. Mellish had raised the question of the payment was going to be in vouchers. There was some concern around that. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it was talked about, but <clears throat> I think our thinking was that it would, if, if payment was too easy obtained, would vouchers um, Cause people to think before they claimed. I think it was not making it too easy to get compensation. I think that, but you know, I think we're open to any. Obviously, if you made a uh, a, a check payment or whatever it was, would be also uh, awkward sometimes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chafe. So in the policy, it does say that the payment would be vouchers. Um, again, is that because of ease administration as much as anything? Yeah, uh, an element of that, I think. I think where we where we um, we also should store vouchers for where we're, uh, you know, particularly on the retrofit ready work where we're doing assessments at the moment and we need tenants to let us in a lot more often than they would normally. We give store vouchers, so it's almost um, trying to be consistent in other ways of paying people. Um, it doesn't it doesn't change the fact, I don't think that. You know, this this is about being reasonable and practical in terms of the situation that's arisen. You know, we don't want to be bound. You know, it's a policy, but we need to be flexible as well in terms of common sense when we're applying it. Um, so, you know, where people have pay meters and things like that, well, clearly sometimes we make payment up front to get them to cash. Otherwise, we can't put money in the meter, you know. So it's almost like I think there'll be a range of measures that we employ on the back of this policy if it's not just uh, store vouchers in terms of re recompensing people. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Kingston. And I think that flexibility and understanding of personal circumstances feels like the right way forward with this. Um, Councillor Clear, you've waited patiently. Thank you. Um, Mr Kingston, thank you, Chair. I won't be long because I've been pipped to the post on the question I was going to ask was about the compensation and the £15, but I think we might have covered that now because um, Councillor Ferguson mentioned it and I was just going to say that I know it was reviewed and you were going to stay at the £15 and if you could just explain a little more regarding this, but I think you might have answered it when you um, answered Councillor Ferguson's query. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Clear, and apologies for stealing your thunder. I also think um, Oral Ray raised the same issue, so we're obviously all thinking around this specific point. Uh, Councillor Power, you're next. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr Kingston, thank you. Um, I have a lot of council properties that are off the gas grid. And we have encountered some resistance to removing um, other heating systems, as I think you know. We did have some success with the aluminium box. When those properties come, for, I, I, we must put in lower intervention heating. Really welcome, welcome move. Is it possible when we look at um, moving the other heating systems, reiterate our offer, our offer of retrofit ready? It will be more attractive if we can actually put solar panels on the building and say, look, you're, we're getting rid of your gas built boiler, but we're going to put on solar panels to help with the electricity costs. Will that um, overcome the resistance? Uh, it's a very good point. I mean, the we sent out a heating survey before Christmas um, and we had over 800 responses to that. And we also asked people on the back of that if they'd like to be involved in further discussions and almost helping us build a heating strategy. And we had 182 people put their hands up for that. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle that meeting at the moment, but you know, it, we got a lot of interest in this. So I think that will come out of the heating strategy meeting we have with the tenants because like you say, in, in, in terms of the policy at the moment, which goes back to about 2015, I think, when we looked at all the maintenance issues with the stock, um, there are only two heating options then put forward. It's gas or it's quantum heaters. And that stood for seven years now. But clearly things have moved on. And people that are off the grid, well, that means they can only have quantum heaters at the moment. Um, so we are going to have to look at a lot more better options, shall we say, in terms of what we offer people, I think, particularly if we try and move people or we want to move people to all electric systems. And well, if we do that, you know, in, in terms of cost, it's going to cost them more. Even now, probably on electricity than gas. So um, it's what other measures we could put in place at the same time to help them with their bills or keep the bills reasonable. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that will come out of the meetings with the tenants. Um, a very broad group of tenants, which is good really, because there'll be a cross section there. I've got all sorts of heating, whether it's gas, oil, biomass, air source, um, and the pros and cons are what they're already finding in those systems. So there's a lot of interest in it. Interested. Um, thank you, Mr. Kingston. And, and I think it is actually a function that many of our tenants are increasingly concerned about the climate emergency, but they're also increasingly concerned about the rising heating costs, which perhaps has um, you know, promoted their interest in, in this discussion. Um, we haven't yet, for the committee's benefit, we haven't yet um, managed to establish a date, but the intention is to have two um, consultation discussion events. One will be online with tenants for those who want to join online in the evening. And there will also, we are planning to have an in-face discussion with others who prefer to be in the room. But at the moment, we're delighted. Previously, when we went out to discussion, we haven't had this level of response for tenants on this really important issue. And obviously, after that discussion, when we're looking at the future, that will be a, a policies discussion that we'll want to have at this committee as well. Um, I think that's all the questions I had. I just wanted to highlight something in the report, Mr Kingston. I was very pleased to see in section nine of the report on page 63 that in the under the equality duty, you'd, we'd recognised in this policy that the impact may be different for different households depending on their circumstances, physical um, as well as notwithstanding financial issues. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about how we will be dealing with that if a claim comes forward or if an issue is raised. Thank you. It probably goes back to my comment a minute ago about a policy is one thing being flexible and adaptive in our approach because people are affected to different degrees depending on what's happening. And sometimes the follow on circumstances could be a, a rollerball effect in terms of how negatively it's affected someone. So. I suppose I would hope my people in applying the policy are being sensible and reasonable. They have to be flexible in terms of there's an element of common sense of implying this policy. Um, 
and people are negatively impacted in different ways by it uh, and will be by people not turning up or things breaking down. Um, but we need to be careful also that we don't go too far away from you know, the, the guidelines within the policy as well. Um, I come back to common sense and reasonableness, um, and that's what I expect my team to apply in, in, in applying any policy. Um, thank you very much, Mr Kingston. Again, for the committee's benefit, you probably noted in the report that at the moment there's been a provisional budget of £15,000 put in the HRA for next year for these compensation payments. So again, that will be need to be something to be reviewed. I'd like to move into debate on this paper. Does anybody have any debate? Councillor Power, you're first to the post. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I share um, the others' concerns about, about these. Not all coupons. The I wondered whether we could view of this in. Doesn't. I, I welcome the common sense application, Mr. Kingston. Uh, but I just feel that we ought to show a little more interest for the tenants. Um, Councillor Power, sorry, I, I didn't realise that was still a question as opposed to That's a that was a debate. <laughs> OK, um, again, I, I think when we look at the additional recommendations, that will certainly allow us to to consider an issue like that. Do I have any more debate? Councillor Clear, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, please, may I? say a big thank you Mr Kingston and to all the officers for their work in preparing and presenting this paper it is appreciated um, yes we are committed to a high quality service to all yes there are on occasions when our services perhaps do not meet our high standards um, that we strive to achieve this happens to all companies who deliver a service to the public. And as Councillor Gordon Smith made a comment, I wish we had a better service at times in the private sector. But we do thank you. Please may I ask finally that this document is a tenant focused one and easily accessible, please. But on the whole, I thoroughly support it. It's a clear policy and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Clear. Councillor Horrell. Um, thank you, Chair. And um, like others, I welcome the paper this morning um, in our efforts to address the white paper requirements and, and our ongoing desire to provide an excellent service for our tenants and the broader uh, communities that um, we're involved with. Um, I do think this um, is a really good first step. And I welcome the opportunity to review and learn because it's new. What is working? Um, Mr. Kingston's advised us we don't want to get um, uh, make this too difficult administratively. Uh, we've had some concerns about how the compensation is paid. We probably want to have a reasonably uh, short term sort of assessment of how we're doing on this to ensure that it is working to everyone's um, uh, advantage and for best purpose. So um, uh, I would very much um, welcome um, that constant input, uh, particularly um, from those who've experienced the system, uh, the tenants who who've been involved and indeed whether um, uh, as a council we're managing it effectively. So I think that would be good. Um, I like Councillor Clear just reiterate, let's looking forward to a, a tenant friendly version um, uh, because um, we don't want this to be such an onerous process that it, it feels a burden um, and that should uh, hopefully uh, be very accessible to everyone. So, uh, Chair, uh, broadly, I think we're I'm, I'm in favour of where we're heading uh, with those slight caveats about review and uh, 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 attention to some of those details. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Councillor Horrell. Councillor Gordon Smith. Uh, yes, I'm generally supportive of this. I think it's very fair to the tenants. I would uh, urge that we put pressure on the uh, gas contractors and Osbournes to communicate with the tenants. You know, you get some 
We all suffer from this. Someone says we're going to be making a delivery sometime between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Great. But better companies tell you we're going to be there between you know, 9.15 and 10 o'clock or something. Obviously, the smaller window possible. But with modern communication systems and texting and all the rest of it, it's very easy to pass these messages on. And I think the most irritating thing is just being left in the dark. So, I mean, it's obviously not directly the responsibility of Winchester, but if we can try to ensure that the contractors communicate with the tenants as well as they possibly can and keep them in the picture. And I think people recognise that jobs can take longer, but if you can pass the message on saying we're going to be 20 minutes late, people are much happier. Thank you. Um, thanks, Q. Uh, Councillor Gordon-Smith. And um, one of the things that I often think it's it, it's a shame um, is that often I have tenants who come up to me and they tell me just how excellent the service has been, how someone has, you know, said they would come, uh, they've arrived, they've done the job, they've left, and the exact words from the last tap meeting is, and you wouldn't even know they'd been there, well, you wouldn't know we'd had a problem, and it's it's ju it's just a shame sometimes that we don't hear those very positive stories of the excellent work the team the team does, notwithstanding that we do very much need this policy. Um, I just wondered, um, Councillor Scott, you're the only person who hasn't spoken. If you're if you're happy, content. Uh, I'm very happy, and just want to say thank you to the public services because obviously without the public services working through this policy. Um, we're not going to achieve it and I'm, I'm fearful of their staff capacity, but I'm sure uh, uh, Mr Kingston will be uh, on hand for his staff support. But yeah, generally speaking, from a tenant point of view, we we have an absolute fantastic service. Sometimes it breaks down, sometimes we need to communicate that through. But Mr Kingston's team is always on hand when the breakdown happens to actually, you know, Recommunicate with the contractors and get the solution done. But I would say, I concur with what you're saying. There's a vast amount of positive stories and positive experiences of repairs being done. You know, with brilliant uh, tradesmen coming into the door. And sometimes the sad thing as councillors with our casework, we always get the negatives. So on the positive, thank you, Mr. Kingston, for, and your team for all what you do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Scott. Um, Mr. Lyle or Mr. Chafe, is there anything you wanted to add in debate? I'd just like to say that um, in general, we are in favour of this policy and we are monitor it and see how it works over the next few months, hopefully. OK. Well, thank you to everybody on the committee for your comments and um, uh, your questions and debate on this. And, Again, my thanks to uh, Mr Kingston and, and your team, and particularly to Mr White, who isn't here today for all the work that you do um, in services and um, the improvements and the repairs work that's, that's done. Um, I think the issue of review that's been raised in debate, we are going to add the recommendation for a formal review at two years, but we certainly, this policy, as you say, Mr Light, will be something that tax very interested to see, and we can look at that and have, while well, it's functioning at maybe a TAC meeting as appropriate, if you if you agree, at a six month or whatever is an appropriate period to look at that. So, um, Cabinet colleagues, Councillor Power and Councillor Lynn Smith, if we can turn to the recommendations. Um, we have the first recommendation that's on the report that the Cabinet Committee Housing approve the Housing Services Compensation and Reimbursement Policy as set out in Appendix 1. Are we agreed? Agreed. Then we have a second recommendation. That authority be delegated to the Corporate Head of Housing in consultation with the Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Community and Housing to make minor changes when required to the policy. Are we agreed? And the third recommendation that the policy will be reviewed on a biannual basis. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, that brings us almost to the end of the meeting today. Just really to thank you all again to all Cabinet Committee members for your um, 
useful discussions and questions today, to thank the officers that have been with us to take us through the paper and for the presentation earlier. We meet again on the 21st of March, um, where we will have a substantial agenda. So I look forward to seeing you again at that time. Thank you to everyone who's listening to. Goodbye. Thank you.